Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining today. Uh, this is our session, Accelerating Application Delivery with Tanzu on AWS. And uh, we're from VMware, and we'll uh, walk you through our approach of how um, we believe that it's the optimal way to uh, help you accelerate application delivery with a little help from uh, platform engineering. Today, your presenter is going to be me. Uh, I go by Lefty Maracas. I'm not left-handed. Uh, my actual name is Lefteris. And uh, I'm a product marketeer for uh, Tanzu. I've been in uh, VMware for the past uh, six years, as of uh, last week in Broadcom. And uh, I'm presenting together with uh, Derek here. Yeah, hello, good morning. Uh, I think it's still good afternoon. <laughs> Thanks for making the trek over here. My name is Derek Beauregard. Also work for uh, Tanzu. Uh, and I lead our technical platform architects that focus on Tanzu on AWS. All right, thank you. And from our titles, you would be able to tell that I'll probably cover a more conceptual piece, um, like the philosophy part of, the, of our strategy. And uh, Derek will be the hands-on person, will walk us through some demos, and uh, will talk a little bit more in depth about our solutions. Uh, well, this should not come as a big surprise to, uh, every, to anyone. In fact, uh, maybe the number is quite uh, astounding because it's so much. Uh, you see that the world-class application uh, organizations, application delivery organizations, are so much faster, uh, 400 fa times faster than uh, even the leading organizations. But uh, it's been at least 10 years that we've been talking about this. Uh, every company needs to be a software company. Uh, what we've been seeing more and more is that there are really these few dominant companies out there that are very agile. They're very quick to uh, do the updates, add features, react to, to uh, trends now with AI, uh, for instance. How quickly can you integrate this in your products that really win uh, the race? So um, we've seen this across industries, right? Even industries that traditionally have not been software, uh, in uh, cars, in uh, accommodations with Airbnb. Everything is, uh, the, the, the winner is really the people who can, the organizations who can deliver applications uh, at the speed of light. And uh, the way to do that uh, is through employing DevOps methodologies. Uh, and this has been uh, true for the past 15, 20 years, but really the past five to 10 years, big consulting companies and uh, executives have been convinced that uh, we need to do something about DevOps. And that's why probably most of the people here have already got a memo that you need to do DevOps, you need to, whatever that means, we need to, to uh, hop on that train. In fact, 70% of uh, organizations, based on a survey we've uh, seen in Tech Target, is uh, employing some level of uh, uh, DevOps methodologies, DevOps practices. However, uh, more and more, while uh, some companies at the beginning have been success were successful, uh, the more we there is a talent gap, and there are many uh, difficulties that create this kind of gap that even some companies will say, okay, now I need to do DevOps, but what does that really mean? And there are all these difficult things that uh, actually are not really helping me accelerate my application delivery. Now I have way more tools, way more approaches. Uh, my developers are, uh, uh, need to be involved in operations, and not every developer has uh, the skill set that is required. So, uh, also, historically, uh, the developers have been the, the, the early years of DevOps movement where the uh, front runners and were kind of applying their methodologies to operations. So uh, for a while and even today, it has been very difficult to find the right balance in DevOps. Uh, in fact, one of my first projects in VMware was about mapping different, about eight years ago, uh, mapping uh, different uh, DevOps organizations out there. And, uh, well, it was ridiculous. It was dozens different types of, uh, you know, you take some people from one team, you hire a completely new team, some developers need to go to your operation. It was chaos. And thankfully, since then, we have reached to, well, there are still many different approaches and many different acceptable ways to do things. 
but uh, this concept of platform engineering has emerged that has really helped uh, scale out the uh, application, the acceleration application delivery. So the platform engineering, and what does that mean? It means that you uh, create really a product team that approaches all these shared services that your developers will need to uh, deliver their applications, uh, and they approach it as a product, as a product team, with uh, user requirements and roadmaps, with brand awareness, evangelizing, onboarding, training, really a separate team that uh, has a, a full-time responsibility and perpetual responsibility to, to deliver and develop a platform that uh, uh, the uh, developing teams will, will um, use. And when you get this right, and really what we mean here is A, you can see the graph, the security piece gets integrated, and also you create this outer loop of uh, continuous optimization of security, performance, and costs. Uh, well, wonders happen. Uh, you know, this 400 number that uh, uh, we kind of alluded before, it's really uh, uh, one of the technical outcomes that, uh, the first technical outcomes that you will see. But what really um, took the, uh, uh, gathered the attention of the more high level business executive people was the uh, business outcomes and the, uh, the proof that actually this works, this works, uh, this helps companies achieve their business goals uh, by increasing uh, the, the revenue, better customer experience, and uh, uh, generally a more seamless uh, and a better quality of, of, of uh, um, work uh, for the developers as well. So makes uh, also the, the quality go up. So in VMware with Tanzu, uh, as of this year, we have uh, uh, defined our approach and our goal as, well, the title of this session, which is accelerating uh, uh, application delivery, and uh, the way we approach this is through separate pillars uh, to create this comprehensive uh, uh, solution. Uh, we're focusing on develop, operate, and optimize. And uh, it's all about the uh, life cycle of the application uh, uh, development and delivery, but uh, uh, with different parts of our portfolio, we come together to bring this comprehensive solution that cuts across all these different uh, disciplines. So starting from develop, and let's take a, a day at work of uh, uh, you know, a developer, and what are the questions that keep, them up, uh, uh, keep us up at night? What are the questions that really make their uh, work more challenging, their world more difficult? And uh, the main really question is how can I code how can I do my work without caring about all the peripheral things, all the other things that uh, you know, might create a risk or might uh, 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 bring my, my, I have to change to a different application or I have to change to a different environment. How can I just code, write my feature and be confident that it will be stable and secure at production? And uh, so it's a question of, uh, of, of speed, velocity, and security. And there are three main sub-questions that kind of build up to this. It's how quickly can I onboard on a new project or a new developer? Uh, so how quickly can we make available all the right tools to the developers to get started uh, coding? How can we make sure that uh, we create these paths that uh, uh, bring the code to production faster, and uh, how do we integrate security across this whole process? And the reality of most organizations we're speaking with uh, that at least are trying to adopt these technologies are, uh, these uh, approaches, are uh, that there are a host of problems from, uh, you know, ticket-based systems, many different uh, systems that they are not sure which one to use, um, different priorities from different uh, teams. Uh, onboarding can take days or uh, weeks. 
uh, generally an environment that doesn't lend itself to what we're talking about in the beginning, right? You cannot have this type of problems and deliver thousands of uh, uh, updates of releases every year. With Tanzu, we hope that uh, and we are uh, striving to deliver these three outcomes that, uh, uh, at the end of the day, are you know what is uh, also supporting the, the different uh, desired state capabilities that uh, we think are required to get there. Uh, create what we call, call golden paths to production, streamlined, templated paths to productions that are pre-configured and uh, depending on the use case, depending on the project, uh, very quickly someone can uh, get started with them. Um, enhancing the developer experience and creating, uh, integrating security by designing all the steps. And that's what we are bringing with uh, Tanzu application platform that uh, we are working on the next iteration, which will bring together uh, the um, whole components of both develop that we're talking about now, but also about operate that Derek will talk about later. And uh, the, the, it brings some really unique differentiator. Most, first of all, it's really a one sol a solution in a, in a box. So uh, all the things that we're talking about today can be delivered through one solution that you deploy and all the different teams can uh, communicate as a platform, uh, get on it, and everyone from developer security and platform engineering operators <coughs> can um, uh, work on the same platform, speaking their own languages at the end of the day, because really the problem most of these times between dev and ops is that we're speaking different languages sometimes. Um, some of the biggest uh, differentiators that we bring here is that uh, uh, we have an integrated developer portal based on open source backstage that we are uh, adding a lot of proprietary plugins and a lot of uh, proprietary goodness. Uh, we have integrated, we have included Spring uh, Enterprise to make sure that you can uh, run your Spring applications confidently. We have an opinion, so we bring everything out of the box working, but at the same time we allow you to uh, switch in your tools of choice. So there is a, a supply chain kind of uh, format where uh, the different pieces can be uh, composable, can be uh, switched. Uh, and uh, we allow you to run it in any Kubernetes implementation. Obviously, in AKS, cl different classes, different regions. So you, can, uh, you don't have to be afraid that uh, you, know, it will be, you are getting locked in somewhere, uh, VMware or uh, AWS or anything. You just have your own platform you run it on uh, Kubernetes. Finally, uh, we find that m in many of these cases, technology is the easier part, and processes and people are really what uh, um, many of our customers are struggling with. And uh, we really have a very proven and very uh, um, knowledgeable and uh, uh, experienced organization with Tanzu Labs that have been involved in many, many projects already and uh, are really focusing on the processes and the people piece to make sure that all this whole um, approach can work in a sustainable and a long, uh, long way. And uh, I wanted before to passing it on to um, Derek to show us a little bit of a demo about how this accelerating uh, works uh, very quickly. Talk about a customer that uh, we've, uh, uh, we're very proud for. One Magnify is, um, a marketing analytics organization that brings together technology and analytics uh, to provide unique experiences uh, to organization. And uh, in many, many cases, they have different types of projects. They have to develop a lot of new applications very, very quickly. Uh, but the different industries have a lot of similarities. So, Following that approach of like templating your different uh, types of uh, supply chains and uh, bringing your developers on board through our uh, platforms, and especially working together very closely with uh, Tanzu Labs, uh, was really uh, one of the biggest parts of their success. Um, 
they managed to not only figure out how to um, deploy uh, well, our products, but also how to get interest and how to make it a successful thing because no matter how pretty and how useful and how nice a product might be, if uh, it's not evangelized and if it's not uh, set up in the right way, uh, well, it is destined uh, to fail. So uh, in this situation, we had some very measurable results. You can see here that uh, they measured uh, almost 80% increase in administration, platform engineering operator efficiency, and almost 40% increase in developer uh, eff efficiency. What I really like about this example is not as much the quantitative part as the qualitative part, because really what um, their team has been telling us is that uh, the, after uh, the whole project, was uh, over, they also observed a lot of quality, both improvements, both in their code, but also in the, um, in the work, uh, um, in how happy at the end of the day their developers were. Uh, and that's something that you will need to, to uh, bring in all uh, the pieces together, the uh, technology, the people and the processes approach it holistically, and that's why this, this is such a great uh, success story. Derek, I'll pass it on to you to show us a little bit. All right, thanks Lefty. I'll take that. All right, yeah, let's first uh, break into a demo here. Let me switch these. Perfect. Cool, so as, as Lefty was talking about, TAP is very much about the software development life cycle. So going from idea and starting a project through check-in to deployment on whatever that target may be. For example, in this case, EKS. Uh, and one of the things that we frequently hear from uh, developers, how many here are developers on the developer side? Okay, I got one hand, thank you. Um, but one of the things we frequently hear from developers is it's really hard to get started. This could be you're hiring a new developer and it takes them weeks to get on board it. Like, how do I get all my accounts? Where's the documentation? Where are the APIs? How do I get my IDE set up? Um, or it could just be what we're hearing more and more from customers is one dev might be moving from one project to another project and that project has a completely different set of tools. Like they might have some commonalities, but at least the way they use them are totally different. So this idea of if I'm a developer and I'm trying to get started on either a new application or I'm trying to ramp up and get on board with a, an application that I'm working on, perhaps I'm modernizing, how, how can we do that more quickly? Um, and this is where Spotify really took leadership here and they created something called Backstage. How many are familiar with Backstage? So Spotify created Backstage for exactly this. They were looking to make it much more quick for a developer to be able to go um, from starting to their first pull request accepted, or I think it's 10th pull request that they were measuring. But how quickly can they go from idea to actually committing code that they can use? Um, so what we've done is we've taken open source Backstage. It's an open source project. It's great. It's out there. And we've started to extend it. Uh, one of the key ways that we've extended it is we've added templates, which are accelerators. The idea here is you can bake in your best practices. So if you have an enterprise architecture team, perhaps working with security and operations, they can say, look, the best practices for building a Java Spring app that's going to run on EKS is, you know, you should be using Spring Boot, you should be using MVC, whatever that might be for your company. And also, let's use the latest versions, you know, something reasonable for Java and Spring, uh, and you know, maybe some other things for, for security. Uh, and then that can then be published to these templates that you're seeing here that allows a developer to come in and say, hey, I want to create a, uh, maybe a new Java API. So I'm going to come in here and say Java, and we'll create a new Tanzu Java web application. So I'm selecting what you know, the architects or even other developers have created here. Uh, and you may have some minimum configuration, like here I can pick the latest version of Java. We'll, we'll do Spring Boot 3.0 and Java 17, of course. Uh, and then if I click Next, this will actually generate all the files. And this is going to be small, but if I zoom in, you can start to see all of these different folders, including your source, main, Java, uh, your package name, all the way down to the application code. 
And all of this stuff is boilerplate code that developers would have to handcraft, hand create for every single project that, that they're creating. Um, and this gives them the quick start that if I were to run it, which I'm not gonna do right this second, this would just be a hello world application. Uh, you've got the basics there. You could start adding your API, your REST calls, your database interfaces here. Um, so by going through this, you just hit next. Uh, and you'll actually, if I click generate the accelerator, it'll go ahead and build this, zip it up, and drop it on my desktop. I can open in my IDE and get going. One other part I want to show you of this, oh, and I should mention, um, Tanzu's the company behind the Spring framework. So if you're using Java in Spring, uh, Tanzu, we have the, the developers, the committers that are, are making the open source project uh, Spring, uh, which is, probably used in a lot of companies that folks are working for. So one other piece I wanna jump a little bit ahead in the software development life cycle, uh, and we're not trying to take over the whole software development life cycle in Tanzu. We know that your developers are gonna have IDEs that they work in, we plug into those. We know you probably have your CI systems like Jenkins or um, AWS build or uh, code build or code pipelines. Um, but there are points in here that we integrate into the process. And one of those big pieces is plugging into the creation of the containers. So if you're gonna deploy a containerized workload, uh, typically you would have a Docker file or something describing that. Um, but we wanna make sure that we're able to enforce best practices on what goes into that container. So is it just any container base image that's out on Docker Hub that you're starting with? Or are you as an operation or a platform engineering team saying, hey, these are our set of blessed base images based on Alpine Linux or whatever that may be? Because it's really scary if you go out and scan Docker Hub, like how many vulnerable or out of date images out there. So we don't need one that's mining Bitcoin to be your base image out there. Uh, and that's day one, right? Like day two, when a CVE comes out and you have to go say, hey, I've got 2,000 applications running containers. Which ones are patched? Which ones aren't? Do they still have developers on them? How are we gonna update them? That becomes the really scary part. So I get it that's just saying, hey, let's create a Docker image is easy. Yes, but you've gotta have that governance and ability to update that image. Um, so what we're looking at here is a depiction, or it's not a depiction, it is actually a supply chain for one of our application going through it. Um, and I just wanna point out that part of that is building the container and actually scanning, scanning the code. And it's gonna scan it here um, using an open source project called Gripe, um, but it'll scan the code, the code dependencies, and that actual container. So you can come down here and look. So if I was a security person or an operator, uh, and this is all backed by APIs, I'm just showing you the UI because it's better for a demo you can come in here and see all the CVEs that were detected. And we could set up rules in the pipelines to say, hey, if there is a critical or a high CVE, I wanna block that deployment. Like maybe you allow deploying to dev environments so folks can test it out. Um, but for production, like I'm not deploying anything with a critical CVE. And you may have a whole process in there to triage it. You may decide that it's not a relevant CVE and you uh, put that on the allow list but at least you start to have that visibility. Because if you're a CISO or somebody in the security organization and you're getting the question of like all of your containers running out there, which ones are patched, which ones have CVEs, what are the levels, you know, where is that single source of truth and how can you look at that provenance data? Again, jumping ahead in the software development lifecycle to running workloads. This could be me as a developer wanting to look at a Java Spring application I have running, for example, uh, this gives them a dev portal to come in and look and see what are all the resources that make up my Kubernetes-based application. So you'll have deployments and pods and containers, and you can even start to drill in and see all the Kubernetes resources, but not that, but since we are the company behind Spring, it integrates straight into Spring, so I can go in here and look at the health of my Spring application based on what that Spring application is reporting back. So not just is it running and turned on, but is it able to connect to the database? Is it responding in the right amount of time? You can come in here, look at all the log levels. So if I'm having an error, I can go ahead and bump up one of the logs to debug tracing, for example, in real time, out to your application, changing that log level. 
And then kind of the standard things you might do with the Java application, look at the heap, look at the, uh, the stack, look at the different threads. Or another interesting one is just looking at the HTTP requests to see traffic coming in. You know, it's running the container, Kubernetes is, so we know the requests that are coming in, the response rate, the response time, any errors like 400 sets coming out of it. So that's just a preview of, of TAP, but really for TAP, that's pulling together the software development lifecycle from creating and updating applications to iterating on them for a developer in the Kubernetes EKS environment through that deployment out to your different staging, test, prod environments. So let me flip back. All right. So the, the next piece I want to talk about here is uh, operating Kubernetes at scale. Yep, so we'll jump ahead, jump ahead one, thank you. Um, so Kubernetes offers a lot of benefits. And typically as we see customers, and I'm working with customers who are looking to modernize their applications or build new modern applications, there are multiple spots that they can land, but by and far, we're seeing kind of the de facto landing spot, and I'm guessing since a lot of folks are in this conversation, uh, ends up being containerized and on Kubernetes. And as we all know, Kubernetes offers a lot of benefits. The containers are much smaller, so they utilize resources and cloud resources much more efficiently. Uh, they start up much more quickly, so doing things like scaling and recovery becomes a lot more effective. Uh, and that really unlocks a much better developer experience where you can code and iterate and deploy much more quickly, you know, as long as we don't put a bunch of ticketing systems in front of it, but you can put a lot more iterations in to develop business outcomes more, more quickly. So Kubernetes is great, but with that comes a, a lot of challenges. Uh, and what I hear from a lot of customers is the pattern is something like this where you know, a developer or a dev team wants to create a new application, wants to deploy it on Kubernetes. So they, they go out and they spin up an EKS cluster or they deploy open source Kubernetes on bare metal or VMs and they get started. They customize it as they need it. They add themselves as an administrator to that account. And then they add all the other software they need. Like Kubernetes doesn't come with everything, right? You gotta add ingress controllers, certificate management, DNS hooks, et cetera, et cetera. So they get the cluster just how they want it. It works perfect for their application. Maybe they go to prod with it. Maybe they're not allowed to. Um, but all of a sudden you have all of these devs groups doing this uh, and operations may or may not know that this is happening. And then very quickly what we're seeing, especially with large enterprises, is they have dozens to hundreds of Kubernetes clusters out there across Amazon and EKS, maybe on-prem, maybe on bare metal. And I see two things happening at the same time. Number one, the developers are saying, I don't wanna run this anymore. Like it was fun to set up and play with, but I'm not gonna patch this thing three times a year when a new version of Kubernetes comes out. So they're kind of saying like, operations, take, take this back. I don't, I don't want it anymore. Like just make it work for me. And then on the other side, operations is looking out and poking around and saying like, crap, we've got hundreds of these clusters. And I'm seeing easily 100, 200, 300 clusters at large enterprises, so that's not an exaggeration. But dozens to hundreds of clusters, and they're like, they're all different. They're all homegrown, customized. We don't know what's in them. And security, that's kind of even the scarier side, is saying we don't know what's been done to secure these. Are they up to date? What additional software has been on there? What's the network policies for like network ingress and egress? It becomes really complicated. So we start to see this push to say, look, we've got to have a more consistent, governed, and secure way of operating Kubernetes clusters at scale. But at the same time, like we don't want to go back to the far extreme approach of like traditional IT where it's a ticket-based system. You put in your ticket, six months later, you get your Kubernetes clusters. That would really defeat the purpose of using something like AWS with on-demand EKS clusters. So it's all about how can we find this happy medium of on-demand self-service access to clusters with some choice of best practices but using consistent governed security baked in clusters that have been curated out for the developers to use. 
And we start to see, I don't know if it's a buzzword quite yet, but we start to see companies emerging with like a platform engineering, platform operation team that would provide this sort of experience, this sort of platform to developers. Now this may just be cloud ops depending on the size of the company, but that's, that's starting to be something we see more and more. Oh, and I, I, I stole my own thunder there, but that's really getting more towards the, the de desired state where it's, hey, let's give developers self-service access to these curated clusters. Uh, and maybe there's 10 options. You know, you can pick a little bit of your versions. You can pick any of the last three supported versions. You can pick your ingress controller. Um, but we know it's going to have this set of security requirements baked into that. So this is where a specific portion of Tanzu application platform comes in. Tanzu is a suite of products that has different capabilities, and one is Tanzu for Kubernetes operations, coolest acronym ever, TKO. Uh, and this is the portion around managing EKS or Kubernetes clusters at scale. So let me jump back to a demo, and I'll, instead of talking to these, I'll actually show them to you. All right, let me... You don't have to be able to read the specific words, but someone in the back, is that legible? Yes, good, perfect, thank you. Um, so when you first jump into TKO, the first thing you're gonna see is all of your Kubernetes clusters, or at least all the clusters that you're authorized to see. But as a platform engineer or operator, you log in, you'd see all of your Kubernetes clusters. Uh, I've got a bunch of EKS clusters in here, of course. Um, but it could also be on-prem clusters on vSphere. Uh, we support any conformant Kubernetes distribution. I, I saw a Red Hat over here somewhere. So even Red Hat OpenShift, uh, if that's, that's what you're using, that's, that's great. We're not trying to compete with EKS. If you're running on AWS, we're going to recommend, hey, go, go run EKS out there. Uh, we can pull it in. This dashboard is going to give you very quick kind of health information, kind of a heads up dashboard. And then as you drill in, you can start to look at the details of your cluster. What is my resource allocation? How much am I using? This one, I'm using a lot of CPU. That might be something to look at. It's just a little test cluster here. But how is the health of the different components in there? And can start to look at, okay, how many nodes do I have? How is each node doing? What are the namespaces I've created out there? You know, you might want to be creating namespaces for your developers if that's the way that the operations happens, or if you give developers self-service access, they could create namespaces themselves. And you could even start to drill into like, hey, what are, what are the different workloads out there and et cetera. But the big thing here is when you get to many clusters Dealing at the individual cluster level, whether you're doing it, I'm showing the click ops here, but whether you're doing it click ops or with scripting or with CLI, if you're having to do this for every single cluster individually, that, that doesn't scale, that's gonna be error prone. So the big thing we introduce is grouping of clusters. So cluster groups where I could have, you know, this might be my Acme Fitness application for production. And I can go in there and look at what are the different Kubernetes clusters that I have grouped together here. And then pretty much any operation we look at in here will take effect at the cluster group level. So here I might want to say, you know what, for this group of clusters, I want to turn on data protection. Sounds boring, protection's boring, but hey, I want to make sure I'm using open source Valero to back that up to S3 buckets that way, if somebody has a potentially career-impacting uh, error, you've got a backup of that, and you can restore your clusters. And any cluster that gets spun up within this cluster group just has data protection turned on. And then the nice thing is, when you go to create a new cluster, so let's come in here and say, I'm going to create a cluster. I'll create an EKS cluster. We will call this reinvent. What room are we in, Lefty? It was. Uh, to anyone? 121? 121? All right, 121 to make sure this is live. I'll create a cluster. I will add it to my cluster group. We'll go ahead and select my Amazon account. And that's the other big thing. Um, when you're dealing with like EKS clusters, they're tied to an account in a region. So TM, 
TKO is giving you visibility to, if you're authorized again, all the clusters across accounts and regions for, for your company. So you're not having to bounce around between accounts or regions and see what's there. Um, but I'll pick my account. We'll pick 1.28 for Kubernetes. Um, I'm not gonna put this in Africa. We'll put this US West 2 in my VPC. I'll add a security group that I know is good. We'll, make, we'll live dangerously and make the uh, Kubernetes API public. Click Next. Then you gotta configure what is the compute, what is the node pool here. I'm gonna leave most of these default, but let's say, hey, let's turn on auto scaling and scale this up to five nodes. Uh, we'll leave the default AMI instant type. Um, the networks look good. We'll click Next. We don't need a proxy. We'll click Create. Uh, and this is gonna go out create the EKS cluster, add the node pool, add the EC2 instances, set up the auto scaling group, add backup and uh, restore on there because we configured it, uh, and a number of other things that I'll show you here in a second to do with role-based access control and policy. Um, if any of you have spun up an EKS cluster, it'll take about a half hour to do that. So in the spirit of baking shows, I will just show you in EC2, or not EC2, sorry, EKS. If I zoom in here, I had two existing ones and this reInvent 121 uh, is being created. So this will spin and be created until the cluster is ready for me. Uh, and then eventually back in TKO, this will come up and I'll see the health information like I did any of my other clusters. A Couple of things I do wanna highlight here. Uh, access management to Kubernetes clusters I think is so underappreciated. So, AWS has IAM, it's awesome, manages role-based access control to all of your AWS resources, including EKS clusters from the AWS point of view. But once you get in that cluster, Kubernetes has its whole different authentication and authorization model, right? It has roles and role bindings. So you have to do a manual mapping in there for every single IAM role or every single IAM group to map that role to a cluster and perhaps to any of the namespaces and resources it has in, the, in there. So imagine you are trying to say, hey, my Acme Fitness development group gets access to the development namespace in these three Kubernetes clusters across three regions. You, could, you would have to go to each and every one and manually configure that and keep it up to date. So the point here is let's have something that just automates that. So I can go in here and say for, hey, this cluster group, I'm gonna go in here and I can look at what I'm inheriting from all of my settings or just for this cluster group. I can create a role binding and I'm gonna say, hey, I'm gonna give this one read-only access and you can define what access policies are in there. We're gonna set it up to be a group and this group will be my OU dev team, for example. I should probably give devs better than read access, but uh, we'll just do that for, for now. Uh, and because I set that at the group level, that'll percolate down to all of the different clusters that are in that group. Same thing applies to policy. So different types of policies you might wanna apply. Uh, for here, you've got your pod security policies. Um, that may not still be big enough, but I will read through it. I'm just gonna select a custom one here, but this is allowing you to set things like can containers run as root or escalate as root or what user should they access? Are they allowed to use volume mounts? And there's, you, know, you get into all of the different Kubernetes specific there. But again, I can set that policy on a group of clusters. I can set it for my entire organization. You can have one default policy and then you can overwrite that for a set of clusters. And then if you even wanted to, you could drill down and say, hey, for this particular cluster, I'm gonna make a change. So this tends to really resonate with the security organizations or CISOs where they're looking at this and saying, look, I can have a consistent set of security policies I'm applying to my containers and Kubernetes clusters. And other things you might, I'm not gonna read them all to you, but another big one is uh, what image registries are you allowed to pull from? So perhaps in dev, you can pull from any image repository, but in production, it can only be our image repository or your like ECR image repository and not all of Docker Hub. 
and we can only pull if it's a signed image. And like we showed earlier, perhaps without a, you know, a critical CVE in it. Networking is always you know, one of the hearts of security, so looking at what is allowed to talk to what, what microservice is allowed to talk to what, or network ingress or egress. Uh, and finally, just being able to set quotas. So you could say, hey, for this namespace, uh, for this set of developers across clusters, they're allowed to use X memory, Y CPU, that sort of thing. And I think that was all I wanted to show. I mean, there's a number of other things you can, can do in here. Um, but that's, that's really the heart of it. And I really look at this as, you know, as you're looking to manage fleets, so, you know, dozens or more of Kubernetes clusters, um, especially EKS clusters, but any conformant Kubernetes cluster, this is where uh, TKO uh, really shines. Um, and we were working with one credit union that was looking to modernize a lot of their backend banking applications, uh, including some of their machine learning uh, applications, which I believe were for fraud. Uh, and they had said, okay, look, we're gonna set up Kubernetes as a centralized distribution of Kubernetes ran by operations uh, and give that to developers. They'll love it, things will be great. And you know, a couple months go by and they're like, the developers don't like this. They're not using it. We're not getting any adoption. They're still going straight to, uh, to EKS. So we worked with them with Tanzu uh, to deploy Tanzu, so they were able to not only impact the technology, but through working with us, kind of build a more product-focused platform where they were getting feedback from the developers, where they could give them self-service access to Kubernetes clusters that had best practices baked in, but they still had choice in being able to decide what was in those. Uh, and for them, they saw a 50% reduction in deployment time, um, speeding up their deployments to Kubernetes. So as Lefty mentioned, Tanzu is a portfolio of capabilities. What we've really focused on today is the app application and container-centric side of this with Tanzu application platform. From the developer backstage-based portal for getting developers started to the supply chains going from idea to code through all the steps to production and the automation of EKS or Kubernetes operations at scale. There's another side of the house that, I don't know when the other session is, but there's another VMware Tanzu session talking about the Tanzu intelligence services side of the house, which really gets into how do you look at the cloud spend that you're doing and optimizing cloud spend. How do you look at the more broad AWS configuration and policy, especially around IAM? Uh, and then how do you monitor all this? How do you get insights on the performance of things going from the application down to Kubernetes through the AWS or vSphere performance, even down to bare metal if you're in a physical environment? So if that side of the house is interesting to you, stop by our booth, look for the other session. Um, I will mention we do have a, a large booth right at the uh, beginning of the uh, expo hall. Uh, we have live demos of, I wanna say all of this, most of this, if not all of this, happier to go deeper. Uh, and I do wanna mention one thing on the bottom here is uh, Tanzu Labs. So we have a rich experience coming through uh, Pivotal of a consulting organization that can not only help standardize and set up the platform and best practices around it, but can help with building and migrating modern containerized applications to that, that platform. Um, want to avoid the case in a, a common anti-pattern we see is where people will stand up Kubernetes-based platform, offer it to developers, and kind of like field of dreams, like if you build it, will they come? How do we break that and actually get some applications over or get some wins so that you can build momentum? And this does, I like to tie this back to like what are the business outcomes or what we're, are we ultimately looking to achieve? Um, Lefty had shared some industry metrics in the beginning, and these are metrics that come specifically from working with our customers, uh, where we've seen significant improvements in developer productivity by allowing devs to focus on their code and eliminating a lot of the boilerplate, a lot of the tickets, a lot of the manual processes, uh, which very much leads to getting code faster time to market. 
uh, not just once, but for me, it's, it's very much about being able to iterate on code, get feedback, come out with the next version. And then the, the same time on the operations side, being able to operate more efficiently, both in terms of the manual tasks that you're doing, as well as the underlying infrastructure, be that physical infrastructure, be that you know, AWS resources. Uh, and then finally, security is a key piece in this in wanting to make sure that we're baking security into the process or you know, as the, the buzzword is more shifting security left, but we wanna build it so that we're making sure security is happening early on, but we don't wanna just shift the burden to developers of having to do that or hoping they'll do it and not do it. By, by doing things like making sure that we're scanning everything that is going through our pipelines and blocking things that either aren't signed or have high CVEs. So as I mentioned, it's, it's a portfolio of products. Uh, we do contribute a lot to open source projects that is part of our portfolio. Hopefully you've heard that as a common theme in here. Really would highlight the Spring framework. That's not the only thing we do in here, but being the stewards behind Java and Spring, we try to make it the best landing spot for Java and Spring. And like I said, we're, hap we're happy to talk more. Swing by, swing by the booth. Um, asks us questions after this. Um, we're gonna take questions out in the little hallway so they can set up for the, uh, the next session that's coming right after this, uh, or feel free to shout them out right now. Um, but stop by the booth. Uh, we've got people, uh, SEs on my team that are happy to demo, answer questions, go deeper into this. And I think you had one more slide. If you're looking to try it out, um, you can scan this QR code. I'll leave it up here as the last slide. Uh, we have a hosted environment that's running on AWS that allows you to try out Tanzu application platform uh, on your own, kind of at your leisure. So with that, I'll go ahead and wrap up. I'll leave this one up here so the QR code's there. Thank you all. <laughs>